Good afternoon, everyone. This is Francis Shelfout. So we're starting the one o'clock hour. Um, I'd like to introduce myself first. Um, I am the co-chair of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission Transportation Committee. I'm also a member of the Wisconsin Mississippi River Parkway Commission Technical Committee. And for my full-time job, I'm the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. I would like to introduce to you your next presenter, uh, Ciara Schlichting. Ciara is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners with Tool Design. As Director of Operations for the Midwest, Ciara leads a multidisciplinary team of planners, engineers, and landscape architects that work in the Midwest and across the country. Ciara has led complex multimodal transportation, land use, and parks and trails projects. She has worked on multimodal projects ranging from planning routes on the U.S. bicycle route system to state statewide bicycle and pedestrian plans to transit planning and redesigning streets to pe for people of all ages and abilities. Ciara brings her extensive background in land use and environmental planning to her multimodal transportation projects to deliver projects that balance multimodal transportation needs with the community, land use, environmental, and infrastructure needs. Specifically, she helped plan and implement the Mississippi River Trail and U.S. Bike Route 45 through Minnesota with, with the assistance of Minnesota Department of Transportation, earning the Planning Innovation Award with the Minnesota Chapter of American Planning Association and the National Transportation Achievement Award with the American Planning Association. Ciara has never lived more than five miles from the Mississippi River and travels along the Great River Road and the Mississippi River Trail on a daily basis for commuting, recreating, and meeting daily needs. Please give Ciara a warm Mississippi River Parkway Commission welcome. Welcome, Ciara. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So I, I have to have some street cred here talking about transportation. So I want you to know that I grew up in a very rural area. You see a town of 2,000 people on the Mississippi River. And then I came to Minneapolis uh, to go to school. You'll also notice I like lots of weird photos of myself associated with the river. So I literally dressed up as multimodal MRT for Halloween. That's the picture in the middle. And this is my tool design crew in Minneapolis um, getting ready to go bike our bikes into the river. Got a snorkel on and everything. Um, next slide, please. I've had a lot of multimodal experiences on the Mississippi River. I've driven the Great River Road my whole life, having grown up uh, and living along the river my whole life. I also paddle, motorboat and fish, uh, and bicycle as well. Uh, I also commute by my bicycle on the Great River Road um, every day, I'll say pre-COVID. Uh, next slide, please. So our session comes at that fun slot right after lunch and in hour five for all of you that have been attending the entire annual meeting. So we have created a very interactive session and are talking about multiple modes. So we're gonna talk about connected and autonomous vehicles, do some polls and discussion, then bicycling and then pedestrians. So we're gonna to try to cover um, all of the modes that you see here on the slide. So we're gonna open up with our first poll. So how would you, how safe would you feel riding in a car that drives itself? And please click on your answers. I'd feel safe. I'd feel safer if I could take over control. You know, I do not trust driverless cars, or I just don't know yet. We'll give you a few moments to submit your answers. Make sure your mouses and keyboards are working. And can you pull up the poll slide, please, when, when it's time? See those results coming in? Yeah, having the human being, being able to uh, take control uh, is definitely uh, a bit of the consensus here. Very few people are feeling safe. Some people are like, I just don't trust it. And some, you know, I don't blame you, kind of, kind of reserving it there. Um, so we'll go ahead and close the poll and move to the next slide. So connected and autonomous vehicles. I thought we should start with a little bit of definitions. Um, and so automated or autonomous means that it has a lot of features and technology that you know, steers, accelerates, brakes with really little to no human input. And some of these vehicles still do require a human to monitor the roadway. 
Now, a connected vehicle, I kind of think of it as like herd mentality. You know, you're using technology to connect to other vehicles, to connect to signals, signs, people biking, people walking. And the theory is that this information exchange will make it a lot safer uh, and also to improve traffic flow. Uh, next slide, please. And when thinking about the future and connected and autonomous vehicles, or I'm going to use, we love acronyms in the transportation field, um, CAV, I just think of a lot of rhetorical questions because my crystal ball is not really clear. You know, will people use CAV to travel the Great River Road? So interestingly enough, um, AAA uh, did a survey um, and they found that very few people um, trust that transportation mode at this point. And similar uh, to the audience here, people would feel a lot more safe if they, as a person in the vehicle, could take over or if there was a backup human driver. Um, and so I'd say that this, this group is definitely um, sort of on par with what the rest uh, of people are, are feeling, according to this AAA poll. Uh, next slide. But I think an interesting question for us to ask is, you know, will CAV reduce uh, transportation barriers? You think about mobility. So this is uh, MnDOT uh, had a CAV shuttle uh, as part of the Super Bowl. It only went two blocks, but it was kind of fun to check out. Uh, but it brings up that point of, you know, would people who have mobility impairments or vision impairments now have access to travel the Great River Road when normally their um, abilities limit uh, their ability to drive. I think another thing for us to think about too is expanding access to all populations, uh, especially Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC populations, and having them feel um, welcomed, and I'm specifically talking about folks that don't have access to a car, um, zero car households and things of that nature, um, which I know has been uh, a topic uh, of conversation here during the annual meeting. But something to really think about and what we can do as planners, designers, engineers, um, the folks that are welcoming all of these visitors on the Great River Road is once they get out of that car, will the environment be welcoming for them to get out um, and experience uh, the Great River Road and the Mississippi River? That calls for the need for um, accessible communities, um, implementing ADA, but I think too also welcoming and having an inclusive environment um, for everyone so that the histories of everyone are told, that people can see themselves in the experiences um, throughout the river. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. And another key thing that's talked about a lot is the safety factor. I heard someone once speak and say, hey, this is like a prescription to have zero crashes and deaths um, on our roads. But, you know, will the vehicles and the people in them prioritize safety over what, you know, some rider preferences are? So you think about it, will the car right? It's going to have to obey all of the signs, right? So you're winding down the river road and you see the curve you're supposed to take at only, you know, 25 miles per hour. If I ask for a raise of hands, does everybody slow down that instant to make it around the curve? Well, maybe not. Um, and if humans are overriding that slowing down, some of those safety benefits may be missed. Uh, we know speeds slow down when you hit small towns or are coming into urban environments because there's a lot more pedestrian activity. And so can the cars detect higher levels of pedestrian activity and drive much, much slower? You think too about low visibility when it gets to be night. Um, will these cars be able to detect everyone? Um, you think about, you know, I want to say a small kid um, might look like a trash can, you know, so to make sure that these cars can tell the difference between inanimate objects and people. You know, will they be able to predict when a person may step off of the curb and be able to stop um, in enough time? And so that's where um, managing the speeds of these vehicles, especially where there's a lot of pedestrians, um, and bad weather and curvy roads, I think will be very, very important. Um, I will note that this um, headline is from an insurance company. So that's another topic, but ensuring these vehicles and, and the inherent um, risks involved. So with that, we're gonna have our first discussion on connected and autonomous vehicles. And I'll turn it over to uh, Francis to moderate.
All right, thank you. And if you have any questions, please enter those into the chat. So we actually have uh, our first question uh, that came in, Ciara. How do you see CAV being used to the betterment or the detriment to the Great River Road? Right, right. Well, I think if it can expand access for populations, um, for people, as I said, that may have um, mobility issues or even just access to a car, um, I think it could be great. I mean, you think about even kids trying to get the, that younger generation out. Well, if they don't have a car, because a lot of kids aren't driving and cars are really expensive, you know, could they actually rent um, a CAV car sooner than a normal rental car, right? Would let them rent when they're 25. So I think that could expand access. Um, on the detrimental side, uh, it is the ability, I think, for those cars to detect everyone no matter the color of your skin, no matter what you're wearing, no matter what those light conditions are. And so I think that's, that's what's yet to be seen, um, is if it, it truly will be equitable in how these cars detect everyone that's out using the road. To add to that, I also think there's also the idea of betterment and kind of leading off of what Ciara says as far as um, access is, is um, connected and autonomous vehicles gives the option for even a guided tour bus, for instance, to carry a population and to have a guided verbal tour where you have either auditory or, you know, um, a word and, and, and slow down to say, uh, we saw uh, Johnny Cash's home, um, you know, they could slow down and, and you know, take pictures or, you know, and there'd be some auditory description that comes with that vehicle. It would be pre-programmed with certain things um, that could either be accessed as part of the rental or could be automated through um, uh, web apps and stuff like that for people to utilize through their phone and so on and so forth that, hey, we're driving the Great River Road on this tour system and it would and it would give you those auditory cues. The other thing that I think is to the detriment is, is that the unpredictability of what those uses might do to overall vehicles on the road. Um, we talk about um, you know, delivery systems and Amazon and all those different things. And if there was connected and autonomous vehicles that somebody could call on or send to do deliveries, would it change how our system works as a whole? And will it increase traffic in areas where maybe we you know, don't see as much traffic these days or, or increase traffic where it's already really busy? Um, and that would be to the detriment, not only to the vehicular travelers, but also could be to the pedestrians, bicyclists, and everybody else that's using it alongside the roadways. So there's definitely pros and cons to just the unpredictability of increases in traffic, decreases in traffic, accessibility, definitely um, uh, the mind can go in a lot of directions. We have another question here, uh, Ciara, about um, these vehicles and if they would need electric charging stations along the road. Could you speak a little on that, please? Yeah, I mean, if they were all powered with electricity, you know, an E, an ECAV, we need as again as many um, acronyms as possible. Yeah, then absolutely you would. Um, similar to if it's a, a car sharing. Um, situation that is uh, electrified as well, um, but not knowing how the technology will will evolve, there still could be you know hybrids um, that still use gas or or things of that nature. But yeah, that's a very interesting question because both CAV and other um, modes may need changing charging stations. We have another question about um, with how does CAV deal with spontaneous choices to turn or to stop at an attraction along the way? Right. <laughs> My easy answer is I don't know. Um, it depends on, on the technology. Um, but something I was thinking of was, you know, can you auto communicate with the car to say, oh, you know, you're in their car and you point and the other person corrals over and does that. Um, ideally, the car would not be able to make these dangerous moves. Um, it would know that, oh, hey, that's a corner. I can't go that fast. Um, or it would have to turn around um, to find its way uh, to wherever um, that destination may be. So I would say um, the jury's out, but ideally it would make the safe choice. Um, and second, Firstly, and secondarily, a direct choice. 
Certainly, thank you. We have um, about two more minutes, a few more questions um, here. Are there autonomous water vehicles or land water vehicles that are available for use on the river road or on the river itself? Right, like autonomous ducks, right? Wouldn't that be amazing if you could be on land and then um, go in water? Um, I am not aware of them, but I've got a bet that it's it, it could be um, in production. I mean, I think the hard thing with the boat is it doesn't have the same sort of brakes, of course, that a car does and, you know, to steer a ship. Um, you, you need to make those decisions uh, a little bit beforehand. Sounds good. And our last question um, is about uh, signage and, uh, you know, how do we plan for these vehicles? Um, do we do we do signage differently? Do we need to be included in software? What how, how can you speak on that? And that will be our last question for now. And um, I encourage everyone continue to send your questions through and, and we'll be able to address them in a separate format um, at a later time. Thank you. Right, so on signage, I mean, ideally the great thing is they're not gonna miss the sign. You know, they're not gonna be, oh, look at that beautiful river. Oh gosh, I missed, I missed my route navigation sign because the car will be absolutely focused um, on the roadway. Um, but with technology upgrades, you know, how do you make um, a smarter sign? You know, so, hey, this is a pedestrian warning sign. It may not have a speed attached to it, but by ideally by reading that, it would know that it needs to slow down um, to a certain point. Um, so I say the, the jury's out, but I, ideally it should be able to, to keep you uh, where you want to be and following those signs. All right, well, I think that was the last question. So we're gonna move on to our next mode, um, which is bicycling. So uh, as, as Francis mentioned, I have a, a really like a love connection with the Mississippi River Trail, um, having the experience 10 years ago, actually working with uh, Minnesota to establish it. And it is a unique relationship between the Great River Road and Mississippi River Trail. If there's someone who doesn't know what MRT is, um, just so you know, there is not a shared use path that goes all the way from Lake Itasca down to the Gulf of Mexico. What MRT is, is it makes the best of existing infrastructure um, that is more, in theory, bicycle friendly or the most bicycle friendly route. And so in some areas, the MRT and Great River Road are co-located, but not all Great River Road segments are really good or comfortable for bicycling. And so the Mississippi River Trail isn't always on the same alignment. And if you think, gosh, who is gonna bike the whole 3000 miles? You know, it, not everyone, um, but there are folks who are interested in doing a couple of states um, or even biking near home. But I think a real game changer is e-bikes, you know, elect electrified bicycles. And they are growing in popularity and as they grow in popularity the cost will come down and that can be a real game changer for long distance travel um, and a game changer for people that have health issues or you know mobility issues or limitations they got two bad knees and a bad hip and you know they can bike all right but going up those hills is really hard um, or as populations age um, they could have electrified trikes so um, this part of the session, I really want to share some resources for you um, to help you both plan um, and design segments of MRT that are in the communities that you work in and love. Uh, next slide. So the FHWA uh, recently issued a bikeway selection guide and a new feature of it is that there are user profiles. It recognizes that not all bicyclists are the same. And so they categorize people into four different categories. And you go, oh, there's only three, what's the fourth one? The fourth one is no way, no how, I am not biking. So I didn't bother putting them up there with their grump, grump arms there. So the largest segment of the population are what's called interested but concerned. And so these are folks that, you know, a four inch white striped line, a bike lane is just not enough separation from them and motor vehicles. You know, they're the folks that are probably gonna bike on a sidewalk before they're gonna bike um, in the travel lane and they really prefer separated facilities. Um, I think of this as, this is me when I'm biking around with my kids and 
I am very interested in biking with them, but concerned. Um, then the next group is somewhat confident cyclists. So I'd say they prefer separated facilities, but they're going to be all right in a bike lane or a paved shoulder. Um, and this is like normally me when I'm commuting and going places. I mean, yeah, I prefer separation, but I bike on the Great River Road to work. And guess what? There's no trail there, but I do it every day. Um, and then the last group are the highly confident. These are the folks who maybe you know they're crunched down on their bike. Maybe they wear spandex, but they will bike just about anywhere. Use the most direct route. This is me if I'm late for work or a meeting. I will take the most direct route um, and go, go on the road. Uh, next slide, please. So the bicycle design guidance recognizes these different user types and the land use context. So what it says is in rural areas, the target user is really those highly confident or somewhat confident folks, the people who are going to bike because they have to get from point A to point B. I mean, I grew up biking to my best friend's house on US Highway 10, 10 foot shoulder. That's just what you did. It was the only way to get to her house. Um, and so the guidance um, pairs that user's needs with the roadway context. So this is a nomograph that's in the guide and it helps give you guidance on, do you need a shoulder or how wide should the shoulder be based on the vehicular speeds um, as well as the traffic levels. So you can see on the graph, the higher the speed and the more traffic, the wider um, the shoulder becomes. Uh, next slide, please. The guidance also applies to the other land use context, the urban, suburban, and small towns. And there the target user is the interested but concerned, or just like regular old people who are interested in biking. And so in this case, the idea is to provide more separation for those cyclists so that they will use their bicycle and take these trips. Similar to the rural um, nomograph, again, it's based on speed and volume. And you'll see as speed and volume increases, the level of separation increases as well. So if it's low volumes, low speeds in a small town, a shared lane might be just fine. Um, but as you get more traffic uh, and higher speeds, that's where you're gonna want um, some separation or even a shared use path. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another resource, uh, and this is from MnDOT, is a bicycle route planning guide. So I had the uh, great pleasure of working with MnDOT on MRT, which of course, uh, as you may know, is United States Bicycle Route 45. Um, and so MRT is both a national route that went through an extensive community engagement process and designation process, um, and it's also a state route. Um, so I have the link here on the slide so you can find it. And then next slide, we'll kind of share the table of contents. And so I must say that, um, next slide please. Uh, there weren't a lot of US bicycle routes um, designated when we started this. And I'll just say it's really hard going first. So US Bike Route 45 or MRT took several years. Um, and then we did another one in Minnesota, US Bike Route 41 in six months. Um, so we did take all of the lessons learned, both um, planning the routes, working with the community, designating the routes, um, MRT we signed, the other one we didn't and just puts it in this nice little how-to guide. Um, and my joke here too is, so this is transportation nerd, that MRT sign, actually all of my colleagues, we dressed up as non-compliant signs for a group Halloween costume. So lessons learned, see those little itty bitty letters on the bottom that tells you what MRT is if you don't know, you know, what's MERT, you know, Mississippi River Trail, 10 states, one river. Well, that wasn't compliant. That isn't what got signed. And that's why I have one of these extra signs because uh, MnDOT let me, let me keep them. So please learn, learn from our lessons uh, as you're working in your own communities. Next slide, please. Uh, and last but not least, you can't bicycle if you don't have access to one. So of course, it's great if you can put your bike on the back of your car, your van, in the tour bus, whatever it is, um, but that's not always a possibility. Um, so in urban areas, um, some urban areas and some small towns, there are more robust um, bike share systems. But in small towns too, it could be a local bike shop, a coffee shop that has bike rentals. And so, you know, ideally being able to map where all of these bicycle access or these resources are would be fantastic. 
I also just have to have a disclosure that those are my two colleagues and they only posed for the photo riding that bike a little unsafely. So we would never do that if anyone from Nice Ride Minneapolis is on the line. All right, well, uh, before we kick off our bicycling discussion, let's open up our next poll. Get your mouses ready. So we learned about the different type of cyclist. So what type of cyclist are you? Or which one do you identify with the most? As I shared, I'm all three of them, depending on what I'm doing and who I'm with. All right, and uh, if we can show those poll results as they're coming in. Oh, all right, look at that. Almost a third and third, uh, interested but concerned and, and somewhat confident. So we've, we've got some road warriors out here um, and, and a few uh, that don't want to. All right, so we're gonna close that poll and open up our next one. So if you can open up the next poll, So related to the type of cyclist you are, what type of facilities are you comfortable riding on? You know, sharing the lane, the bike lane with the four inch white stripe, sometimes there's six, uh, separated bike lane um, where you're still in the street but separated from traffic or um, a shared multi-use path. All right, hopefully people have made their choices and, and let's see how those choices relate to the guidance FHWA has. Oh yeah, see? So these, these user types are based on, on research um, and 75% and of you guys, the, the, separated, the separated bike lane. So um, that was the, the most popular answer. So we're gonna close that poll and then move on to our discussion about bicycling the Great River Road. Sure, Sarah. The first question that we have, uh, barriers that you have encountered designing or signing bike routes in um, states and communities that you've worked with. Yeah, I would say one of the biggest barriers has been um, people being comfortable guiding people down a road that doesn't have a dedicated bike facility. So it just has a shoulder, maybe it doesn't even have a shoulder, and there's just some level of discomfort, um, especially with you know county engineers, um, they have some liability there. Um, and we encountered that um, a bit when signing um, MRT, and there was a couple spots where, I wanna say, we weren't gonna reroute it, we just didn't put signs up um, to, to get around that. And the second route that we designated, our MnDOT designated, they decided not to sign it um, just because it was, it, 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 it costs a lot and it can be um, a barrier at time. Um, so I'd say that was one of the number one um, issues we ran into. And then a second issue that came up is branding. You know, is this US Bike Route 45? Is it the Mississippi River Trail? And then when you get in town, it might be the Dakota County River Regional Trail or the Mississippi river regional trail um, and you know people that have worked hard on projects to get them implemented are really connected to their brand and don't want someone to sort of come in and swoop that up so there were instances um, with mrt where it's not signed because it's already signed as a different um, bicycling resource Thank you for that. Um, we had another question about um, some success stories that you could share regarding um, bicycling, regarding MRT, just again, within your experience. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll talk about MRT since it's related to the river. And one of the goals was not just to sign um, and, and designate a route. It was really to build up the bicycling culture. And so just having these conversations with some of the major cities along the way really ignited their interest in local bicycle planning and design. Uh, so for example, Bemidji, which is the first you know, big town uh, out of uh, the, the headwaters, they ended up doing 
a, a bike share system. They ended up organizing rides. They are now a bicycle friendly community. So we introduced that as well. Um, other communities too, Winona, which is down a little bit further south uh, by uh, Wisconsin and Iowa, same there. They decided we haven't done a bike plan in 20 years. We should do this and we should figure out the routes. Um, and so that's another success where they're a bicycle friendly community as well. So it's, it's so much more than the route. It's really ideally creating these welcoming places um, for bicyclists that are on, on the river road and MRT. Right, thank you. Uh, the last question we're gonna ask here is, uh, any advice that you have for us as the Parkway Commission um, and we engage in planning multimodal use near or while getting off the Great River Road? Yeah, I think, and I'll talk about this a little bit, is wayfinding, you know? So if you're on the main line, what is off there? You know, again, like in, in some places, MRT is signed, but there may not be the white wayfinding to, where's that really great park? Or where is that local or regional trail I can go to? So you can really immerse yourself in the experience. Um, and ideally, you know, not always have to use your um, digital device because in some areas, you know, reception is not so good uh, along the Mississippi River uh, in some areas. So I would say that would be something to work on is those connections um, to the river um, and, and back out, both the community knowing and the visitors knowing. Sierra, I'd like to double on the idea of uh, when you're talking about designating a route and a route and, and it seemed like um, your workaround was to sign something and we talked about liability a little bit. Did you find that designating and signing were two different elements and created or presented two different hurdles for you as you worked through those resolutions and those different communities that had to, to deal with you trying to get the MRT or, or any bicycle route through their community? Right, right. And I have to say, I feel like I'm speaking on behalf of Liz Walton, who was recently retired from MnDOT and I know is in the crew because she did a lot of that hard work. Um, and there's a big difference between, you know, getting that resolution from the local road authority that says, yes, I'm willing to designate this road as MRT. It's a and put up signs and I'll maintain those signs. I mean, so that was an added um, hurdle um, in the signing and, and designating of MRT, um, whereas the, the other route, US Bike Route 41 or the North Star route, that was the, the resolutions of support. Um, and there is uh, a, an application process um, with AASHTO, since they run the numbering system, to get it designated. You need maps, you need cue sheets, you need those resolutions or sign off from the state. And each state can be different in how they feel they need that support from local units of government, but there is not a requirement to sign the US bike route. So that's not a barrier um, for designation. So you would recommend that those steps be broken up? Then? Would, that, would you say that then or, or all is one step as you're reading? Yeah, I mean, if. It'd be nice to have the route signed. I mean, I'm not going to lie because then you can navigate, you can, you can just feel more comfortable being on the route. So it might be a case of your first reach out, your first round of engagement with the uh, local units of government and such is just kind of test the water to see what the appetite is um, for signing it. Uh, and then maybe deciding um, from there, you know, being able, I'd say to, to give it up if it's going to be a barrier to actually getting the route designated and on the books and in people's route navigation and wayfinding systems. All right. I think we can move on, Sarah. I think we're up time clock here. Great. Well, I saved the most important mode for last, which is pedestrians. Because no matter how you use the Great River Road, at some point in time, you're gonna get out of the car, you're gonna get off your bike and become a pedestrian and really experience the river, you know, touch it, swim in it, paddle in it, whatever it may be, change your mode. See here, there's some canoes um, in the background. So um, once you do get out of your car, you need those accommodations to safely get around. So in, you know, at scenic overlooks or historical markers in towns, 
to have those accommodations um, along and across the roadway that really match the land use um, and roadway context. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, if you know your history of the Great River Road, uh, it, it's, it's a driving route. You know, it's designed for motor vehicle travel. It, you know, this is um, not the Appalachian Trail. It's not something that was intended for long distance pedestrian travel. And so if you're to talk about that long distance travel, it would be a little challenging. You know, there's areas on the Great River Road that are freeways where it's actually illegal um, to walk. And there's other areas where there's high traffic volumes, there aren't shoulders. Um, there's just not a lot of accommodations along the roadway, but I think that is something folks can work on, you know, in, in the more urban, suburban, small town areas. And so what I think is really important for those of us, you know, working on the Great River Road is to have really good crossings um, from one side to the other. Um, and so this is a crossing in Wisconsin that uh, Francis um, pointed out. So on the right side of your screen, which is also east, um, there is a parking lot and a historical marker. And on the other side of the street is what? Well, the river. So of course you want to go down to the river and there's some stairs to get down there. Um, but it is a marked signed um, pedestrian crossing. The pedestrian warning signs are pretty far away because the speeds are pretty high. You know, it's put in a spot that has pretty good visibility. It's got the actual ped crossing sign at it. And there are markings there. I was going to poke fun at someone like, I'm sure those markings have been refreshed um, since, since Google uh, photo was there um, so that you can, can see those markings. Um, so next slide, please. Um, you know, so in that instance, uh, even though it's high speeds, there are lower traffic volumes. So for there, just the, the regular ped crossing sign um, is enough. But if you're in smaller towns or suburban and urban areas, you really need to use, and of course, I didn't put the guidance in here, but the FHWA crossing guidance, as Francis, Francis mentioned, it looks like a Sudoku puzzle. That, that one, if you're uh, familiar with it, um, helps guide you to when you might need a more robust and enhanced pedestrian crossing. So the middle photo is the RRFB, or the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon, um, which is an experimental sign, but um, something that has been proven quite successful in people noticing the kind of flashy flicker. Um, I know my trail that gets me finally to my job has one of these signs. Um, it is on the Great River Road, and it is a, a trail crossing. And I tell you, I feel a lot better being able to push that button and know that those flashes are going and the cars might actually stop for me. You know, and then you have all the way to the Hawk signal, um, which is on the far right, which there you can see it's a multi-lane road, um, much greater visibility, more infrastructure, more cost. Um, also the important um, pedestrian median refuge so that you can make a two-stage crossing for some of these roadways that have um, higher speeds, uh, more lanes and and more traffic there. Uh, next slide, please. I feel like we've already started to talk about this a little bit, um, but I wanted to talk about wayfinding. But before that, I wanted to make sure we knew the difference between route signage and wayfinding, uh, which came up in the question. So this is the signs that keep you on the road. Of course, co-located where we have Great River Road and MRT um, in the same place. And then next slide. Uh, is wayfinding. And so that's the, where do I, you know, I'm off the trail, where do I go? How do I get there? Um, and I have to thank Liz Walton. She just noticed this wayfinding sign in St. Paul just a couple weeks ago and she was like, wow, look at that. So on their regional trail system in their blades, they have, hey, the Mississippi River Trail is here. And also just imagine if you're down at MRT, they send you back up. And you'll see on that sign, the purple blade is scenic overlooks, other things are destinations. And it's just key for people who are in some ways living in the moment. Um, that's how I travel. I just get up, I don't necessarily plan, but boy, if there's a sign that tells me where something interesting is, I'll love it. Cause I don't like staring at my phone, um, navigating maps and such. And so I think that's a huge thing. Um, that we can all work on to enhance the Great River Road um, experience is implementing wayfinding. And I know that's something um, that this group has been working on quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please. 
I didn't know where to put the sharing economy in, so I put it in with pedestrians. I'm kind of cheating. This is sort of the, <laughs> the, the catch-all before our final discussion, but the sharing economy can really help, I think, with that great river road experience. Um, in Minneapolis, we have something that is so cool and so unique is that we have both our bicycle share system, the nice ride bikes, and we also have a paddle share system. Um, so it's pretty amazing. So these, those photos are from the same trip. And of course, this is my, my friends and I um, at work. You take the nice ride bikes up to the paddle share station, you paddle down to the end, and then you can take a nice ride bike back to wherever you started. For me, I did nice ride to paddle share, and then I walked to the bus to take home. So I used four modes for our little work adventure um, this past summer. Uh, but it really just, you know, not everybody has a, a kayak on top of their car, and um, it's just nice to have a place to be able to rent them. Um, of course, there are so many other outfitters up and down the river to have something, you know, more fancy in this urban area as paddle share, but it has really expanded access for folks especially in urban areas um, that don't have uh, kayaks and such. There's also scooters. That's like a hybrid. Are you a pedestrian? Are you a bicyclist? I don't know. You're a nun on a scooter. So that's pretty unique. Um, so that is also, um, you know, and it's more in, in the urban areas. So a little bit of the urbanite story where people are able to, I mean, I see more people on scooters in Minneapolis now than bikes at lunchtime pre-COVID, I must say. Um, but it's just amazing how people are able to get up on their scooters, go to different lunch spots, even go down to the river uh, and go on the trails during lunch. Uh, so that could really expand access and just fun, uh, the sheer joy of, of biking or riding fast. Uh, and then there's also car share. We started to talk about this a little bit um, with CAV, but that's a place too where if access to a vehicle is a barrier, um, for traveling the Great River Road, that, sh that may be the way to do it. And then, I don't know, this might be one of the first questions, like what's next to share? Um, and I'd be interested uh, to hear what you guys um, have to think of that. So we're gonna go to our last discussion, if you can move this slide forward. All right. Yes, Ciara, we had a few questions that came up, just um, piggybacking on your discussion um, right now about um, the sharing economy and, and you talked about um, this being primarily in urban areas. What about the rural areas? And sort of the second part of that, uh, knowing the Great River Road experience is both urban and rural, how do you think it helps uh, enhance that Great River Road experience? Right, yeah, so I'd say the scale is just different. I mean, a lot of small towns already have outfitters with canoes and kayaks, and sometimes they have bikes. So it may not be the robust um, sharing system uh, that more urban areas have, but I gotta say, you know, the city of Bemidji, they figured out a different model um, for Nice Ride where you could rent a bike for multiple days if you were up there um, at a resort, or you were just someone who wanted to have it. Um, and so I think, you know, there, I come from a small town, right? The small town creativity uh, and just entrepreneurship um, that are, people are starting to see or hear about the desire to, to bike that maybe there will be more, um, even a grocery store that could have bikes if they, you know, if the, if the numbers worked, um, there's no good reason not to have it. I've also thought too about um, just all the social um, social media and stuff, just like there's a program called Warm Showers. You know, there's a site for if you're a cyclist, you can find out who will host you um, for a shower. Maybe the same thing could be, it's like, hey, I'll admit, I have an, a, my family has a lot of bikes. If I were nice, I should probably offer them up to visitors so they could experience all these wonderful things uh, that we do here, so. Going back to the earlier part of your discussion, how do you determine the level of pedestrian crossing enhancements that are needed for a given context? Yeah, great question. Um, so similar to that nomograph that showed the bicycling context and what you need there, um, FHWA has similar guidance for pedestrian crossings at uncontrolled intersections. And it's very similar. It's based on speeds of the cars, the 
number of cars on the street and then also the configuration of the roadway. Um, so for example, if you have a six lane roadway, um, a pedestrian crossing arrow and a crosswalk isn't gonna cut it. You know, that's where you would need to have a, a refuge island and, and more signalization. So um, it's all of those um, contexts that are taken into um, consideration. And then there's also engineering judgment, uh, which is another thing that engineers um, are allowed to apply in, in what might work and also experiment. I mean, there's experimental treatments out there too um, that some states have sort of given a blanket approval to so locals can use them and others. There's a little bit of a barrier um, if locals have to you know, pitch a request to experiment um, to FHWA. Great, thank you. And, and our last question here to stay on time, uh, how should we enhance pedestrians' experience? How do we get them out of the car? What can we do? What's some, what are some suggestions? Yeah, I think it's a balance of both the land use and the transportation context. Um, land use is huge. It can message to you that, hey, there's stores, there's things to do here. It can also message to roadway users to slow down lower speeds, traffic calming to create a better environment for walking around. Um, you know, walking around a place that has high traffic levels and speeds is just can be a noisy, unwelcoming environment to be in. So it's really to think of the entire context with the land use, but then also safe, accessible um, pedestrian infrastructure. Um, it is nice to have sidewalks. I mean, some people, I mean, you can walk in the ditch or walk in a shoulder. Um, oh, Gina, yes, trees, we need shade, right? You need benches, you need trash cans. You know, I, I like to think of it as take all of the comforts you have in your car, a roof, you have shade, seating, you have seats, your car is a trash bin. So think of all of those comforts that the car provides and try to provide that through the streetscape. All right, well, if that's our last question, Francis is gonna take it away. Next slide, please. Oh. Well, I want to thank um, Ciara for participating with us today. I know that um, as the Midwest director, she's very, very busy. And, and I just appreciate her uh, ability to collaborate with me and, and, and with the MRPC for this presentation today. Her expertise um, hopefully was very apparent to all of you that were able to listen to her presentation. And then I'm going to leave you with um, some thought provoking items. So I can just go to the next slide here as we move to the next presenter here. So I, I wanted to bring this up because it's it's a conversation that as planners, um, CR and I got involved with uh, very early on when we started talking about um, this presentation. And um, we work under the idea of a National Scenic Byway Program by FHWA and, and I, uh, highlighting the word byway. Um, we are named under the Great River Road um, again, road being underlined, and um, but most of us operate as far as um, um, support of and under statute um, as Mississippi River Parkway or some version of that, and underlining Parkway. And I guess I wanted to bring to everyone's attention whether you're, if you're in planning, I think you're a little more attuned to this, but for those that maybe aren't or aren't in the transportation industry, um, that these three terms. Um, as divisive as our country is at this point, and it's come across politically and in every way throughout the presentations today, um, so are these terms. Um, they don't mean the same things. And unfortunately, we, we interchange them, but in certain circles, they don't mean the same thing. And some of them actually carry a negative connotation depending on who you talk to. And so as we move forward, um, you know, as you know, we uh, talk to the marketing committee and, and and how do we want to portray ourselves? How do we want um, to market ourselves um, to, to attract the most number of visitors, to enhance their experience, to not turn them away before they show up? Because we use a term that may not be as acceptable um, in their circles of runnings. Um, so with that, I'm gonna 
let it go to uh, intermission. Um, I want to let you know that uh, Sherry uh, Kwame from the Wisconsin uh, Mississippi River Parkway Commission will be introducing Mark Felzone for the last session of the day. And I wish everybody a great afternoon.